Morning, Cap. John, good morning. I, and I mean that both figuratively and literally, sir. Morning, Cap. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? The bill is backward. He's ready to talk shop. He's ready to talk stuff. Yes, thumbs sir. Up, thumbs up and away we go. Uh, first thing, obviously, has to do with uh, news out of Atlanta United yesterday and the transfer of Luis Arujo to Flamingo. And uh, it looks like it's about nine point, uh, depending on the exchange rate, somewhere in the neighborhood of nine point seven million. Uh, you know. I know that a lot of folks had high expectations. When, when players come into our favorite clubs, we always have high expectations. And there were moments that I know that a lot of folks saw what Luis was capable of at Liga, and that was what he brought to the table. Uh, obviously, I know that the, the numbers when it comes to productivity are disappointing. But when I mentioned Luis Arujo, what comes to mind for you? Uh, super talented player. Mm-hmm. that um, just wasn't consistent enough, I don't think. Um, you know, I think that the game last week was is a good example, right? Or, or Wednesday was a good example of what he's capable of. Um, you know, it's it's a very good goal. Um, I thought he was lively throughout the game. Um, and, and that's – we just haven't seen enough of that. Uh, and I think that you you expect that. Uh, on a more consistent basis, for sure, of their highest paid player and uh, somebody that's, you know, not only making that type of money, but uh, the transfer value and, and the potential. And uh, so, you know, I, I don't think it was a bad signing because, they, you know, I, I see what they saw, right? You see the potential, um, but we just didn't see enough of it, I didn't think. So I think they did a good job of, of moving on um, from Luis. And obviously it opens up a big... Uh, big gap there to, uh, to fill. And then they need to fill it because uh, we need another piece going forward. Yeah. So we'll keep an eye on that in the, in the summer in the summer window coming up in short order. Uh, Luis is with, uh, with the club through the Red Bulls match on June 24th. And then he heads South to, to Flamingo. Uh, When it comes to just the world of transfers, I mean, you, you've been on rosters worldwide where folks are there, folks are in, folks are out, folks are moving on. How difficult is it for teammates slash club to to focus on what's going on in front of you and focusing on the day to day, even if there's just chatter going on involving pieces that may or may not be with you? How difficult is it to focus as a group in a situation like that where a big name player might be out the door? Yeah, um, sometimes more so than others. I think that you know, within the group, you usually have a pretty good idea of potential guys that might be moving in and moving on. Um, you know, I think it's a little bit more challenging when it's a, it's a sudden surprise player, right? Where it's like a, a mainstay or, you know, someone super valuable to the team and all of a sudden it came out of the blue type thing. Um, those can be a little challenging where you're kind of like, why, right? What, second guessing the brass above of why, why would you do that type thing? Um, you know, but I think for the most part and in general, like guys understand it's a business. And usually if guys are moving on, they're moving on to something better. So you're happy for them. Um, it's not always the case, but uh, especially if they're moving on to Europe, it usually is. Um, so, you know, you're happy for them and you understand like you give somebody else an opportunity. That's how, most guys got their original opportunity. So um, it's just part of the business and um, you tend to move on pretty quickly. You know, it's, it affects you, obviously, if you, if you're really good friends with the player, um, you know, it can affect you a little bit more maybe, but um, I don't know. It's like I said, I think we're used to it um, at a certain point. How difficult is it to pack up your life and go to that next place? Because I mean, as a single guy, I would imagine, that you know single guy you're like yeah okay i know it's the next stage of my career all that kind of stuff but as you get older you know there's relationships there's family there's all that those other kinds of things that you have to to consider in a situation like that how much more difficult is it as you grow older and more set in your career and more experienced in your career to move on even if it's not your choice 
Uh, extremely. And I think that's the reason why old school MLS took advantage of all the veteran, older American players, because they knew, right? You don't really want to move. Oh, man. You don't really want to move a family um you know when, especially you got kids in school and things right so um you know i think that's why the veteran american player has gotten um taken advantage of for a really long time in mls and i think that's changing now with with free agency and things um but back when i was a young player that that was the case because you're right it's it's just like anybody else right it's not easy to take kids out of school and move and or, or to live apart from each other, um, right? Because, you know, that that's always challenging. But even for single guys, and, I, and I've talked to this about, you know, with some players, like going to Europe is not always like, a, oh, you're going to live in some grand city and it's going to be awesome, right? You could go, even if you're in England, you could live in the middle of nowhere, sort of, and in some tiny little town that doesn't have much going on and, you know, just doesn't have what you're used to having if you're in a, a decent sized city in the U S uh, so it can be lonely uh, for sure. So these are all things you have to think about and obviously adapting to languages and customs and, and new teams and, and teammates and all those things. Um, so it's not cut and dry as, as you would think sometimes, but um, you know, the guys that are more adaptable and can, um, you know, adapt quicker to those situations, you know, are able to have success quicker. So then let me ask you this from the mentee perspective, because we all know with younger players who want to establish themselves, sometimes, I mean, you look at the NWSL, they got ki- they have kids and they are kids because they're like one third my age. You got 15, 16, 17, 18 year old players that are doing that are doing well in the NWSL. You, you've got players who are 15, 16 years old, 17 years old who are playing who've been part of it with Atlanta United and with, you know, Caleb and Noah Cobb and players like that, that are turning into success at very young ages. When it comes to, uh, you know, the conversations with those younger guys about those next steps in their career. I mean, I would imagine that the younger player today and possibly mentees understand the, the nature of the business more than probably the generation previous or two generations previous, just because they understand that it's a worldwide game and it's the nature of things. I mean, do you have conversations about how different things are when it comes to travel and how different things are for the younger players? It's like, yeah, the world is different. You have all these things. What are conversations like about the growth of the game and what to expect off the field for younger players? Do they get it these days? Some for sure. Um, th- that's one of the reasons why we started Beyond Goals was to try and help them understand that from a younger age. Um, that like it's so different um, when you're living with family or you're living, you know, in college, um, where you've got like this set schedule, right? I've got school, I've got this, I've got that, I've got training. I come home, I have dinner, right? And now all of a sudden you turn pro, and if you're not still living with family. Right. All of a sudden you're home at two o'clock in the afternoon. And what are you going to do for the next 10 hours before you go to sleep, eight hours before you go to sleep? Right. And no one's looking over your shoulder saying, oh, you got to do this. You got to do that. Right. You have to eat this for dinner. Right. You got to cook your own dinner. You got to figure out how to cook. Right. You got to grocery shop. All these things that, um, you know, the normal adult doesn't do until after college. Right. When they're 23 or so. um, And, you know, we're you have to do this now sometimes when you're 17. And so it's, it's, it's an adjustment and some guys don't do well with that, but um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we started this was to try and help out with some of those things. Uh, But, you know, I do think that younger players understand it's a global game and there's so many opportunities out there. And and with that comes, you know, the, the possibility of moving out of the country and experiencing something new. And I would always encourage players to experience as many opportunities as they can, Uh, because, you know, it's such an awesome uh, life experience, not just uh, within soccer. Uh, But there's definitely challenges, and it's not for everyone. Well, and at the same time, those challenges are a part of that adjustment and and trying to figure out, you know, all right, so I'm growing as an adult, and there are that's a different set of life challenges today with the global game, I would think, than, than, you know, maybe even five or ten years ago with individuals trying to – to figure out, okay, what are the next steps in my life? 
oh, I have this opportunity to go worldwide. I would think that that pressure self-imposed might even be more these days than it was a handful of years ago, too, just because of expectations, both from those who are around you and by yourself. Is that the case? Probably. Um, and, and just everything's more known nowadays because of social media and obviously more coverage of, of U.S. soccer, which is fantastic. Um, but, yeah, when when I was moving to Europe and when guys – even older than me were moving to Europe where there wasn't that much news about it because social media didn't exist yet. Uh, so there was a lot less pressure uh, from the outside than you see now. Right. And, and now there's still that lens of some people that are like, why aren't you going to Europe? Like take miles, for example, right. Where it's like, why wouldn't you go to Europe? Why wouldn't you, right. If, if, are you good enough? Show us that you're good enough. Right. And, it's like, well, Miles doesn't have to prove that to anybody um, if he doesn't want to, right? If Miles doesn't want to go to Europe, he doesn't need to go to Europe for his career. He's already a starter on the national team. So why does he have to go to Europe if he doesn't want to go to Europe, right? So, um, you know, every, every, every player is a little bit different. Their ambitions are a little bit different. And, um, you know, it's, it's understanding that and not feeling that pressure of I have to, right? It's some players want to, but others don't need to. And I would think also at the same time that that would contribute to the, the acknowledgement of the growth of the game here in the United States where players who have the chance or the option to go overseas, they're like, no, I'm good. I mean, because Major League Soccer right now is probably, what, a top 12 league worldwide? And I think that the next step in MLS's quote-unquote legitimacy, you know, with the with the, the countries in Europe, it's like, oh, Major League Soccer, no. Why would you want to stay there and play Major League Soccer? I think that players staying home instead of going overseas, would is that next step for MLS when it comes to the worldwide game. It's like, oh, you're staying there now. Okay, if I'm a player in Europe, maybe I should be interested in hopping over instead of the other way around. I mean, am I far off there? No, and I think that's, that's why you saw guys like Michael Bradley and Josie get these massive contracts when they came back from Europe because MLS wanted to have their U.S. national team players playing in MLS. Um, so I think that's the reason why um, you saw those those contracts, um, because that was the push. And, and I get that. Um, no matter what, you're still going to have guys with different ambitions, right? Um, you know, still all the English national team players don't play in England. Um, you know, I think Italy is probably like maybe one of the only ones where those guys kind of stay put. Right. But, um, you know, every national team, their players are playing all over. They've got different ambitions. Um, like take Mexico. I mean, <laughs> a lot of the Mexican players are in Europe now. Uh, so, you know, and the Mexican league is, is supposedly better than MLS. Right. So it's, you know, I, I, I don't know. There's always going to be the player. It, that has the desire to go to Europe, right? And play in UEFA Champions League, right? And play um, in, in, in the countries over there um, because we're still not at the level of, of the top leagues over there. And we won't be probably for a little while longer, uh, which is okay. Um, they've been around for a lot longer. They've still got a lot more money, especially in England. Um, but the lure of Champions League and, and some of those, it, you're not going to prevent everyone from going over there. But yes, you're always going to have that Landon Donovan, um, maybe Miles, you know, these players, Walker Zimmerman, these national team players that want to stay in the U.S. and and develop there and have really good careers. When you were going overseas to play, and we talked about support systems, and, and, I, and I apologize that this is going all over the place because, uh, you know, you'll, you'll say something that will trigger and it's like, OK, I've got to hang on to that. When you were going overseas to play, we talk about support systems. What was uh, what was it like for you reaching back to the United States to try to catch up with folks? I mean, uh, how difficult was it? it you know, were you staying up later? Were you getting up earlier to try to talk to folks? Did you have uh, unlimited international calling on your phone? Uh, you know, because today it's like phone and WhatsApp and all this kind of stuff. How difficult was it to reach back to that support system? when you're overseas and I would imagine 99% of your support system is back here in the States. How difficult is that? Yeah, it's a little challenging. I think it was a six, it was a six hour difference from Denmark um, to the East coast. Uh, and so, 
you know, it's, it's all about scheduling things. Um, you know, it was like, you know, you can't just always pick up the phone and, and just call somebody. Um, you know, back then I was using Skype, uh, like I had a Skype phone number. Yeah. Um, so that, that was everything uh, for me. It was all on the computer. Uh, I didn't have my first iPhone, I think, until I went to Germany. So, um, <laughs> yeah, different times. So I wasn't even like texting anybody. Um, but no, that, that support system is crucial. And, uh, you know, I had my wife move over there after six months. So I was there with her. Um, but I was still able to, you know, catch up with friends and family and, um, you know, some former players that I kept in touch with. And I think I've said previously, I got really lucky that I had a great teammate and his his girlfriend live right next to me. And literally they took me under their wing. And I, even though I was a few years older than both of them. Um, but I was there like every day for hours, um, just hanging out because, uh, that was before my wife moved over. Um, so really fortunate with, for that. How much of your support system as a player is still with you today? How many of those numbers from teammates and friends and family and, and folks that were tight with you, how much of that support system is still with you today when, when you were, then when you were a player? Uh, most, most, I mean, you know, some players you're very close with, uh, when you play with them and then you move on or they move on and you stay in touch for a little while, but then you kind of grow apart a little bit. It's tough to stay in contact with everybody. Um, but I think that you've, we've got a really unique situation with the bonding and the experiences that we've all gone through. So if you ever bump into that guy or, or talk to him every now and then it's like, you know your best buds and you haven't missed a missed a day. Um, but we don't keep in touch regularly. Um, like good example, like I went on this golf trip last week and uh, was with a bunch of former MLS players. And, um, you know, it was so great to hang out with them and, you know, tell stories and stuff. And it was like guys I competed against guys I played with. Right. But it was like, you know, all of a sudden we're just all really good friends, right? Because we've all kind of gone through that same experience, lived the same type of life, you know, now transitioned um, into different things and talking about that. Uh, so um, good group. How'd you shoot? Oh, I didn't play my best. I didn't play my best. 93 twice and a 99, which the 99 was a second 18 of the day. And I'd say the drinks were heavily flowing by then. So it didn't, help. It didn't help. So, so did you end up having to to uh, purchase a mulligan on each on each uh, nine for that second round? How did that work? No, there was there were no mulligans. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that would have been smart. I I think all of us about midway through that second eighteen were like, we should have played scramble. <laughs> <laughs> when, so when it comes to the the mentees today. When it comes to their support systems, you know, whether it's the, the guys that you go and golf with, whether it's the guys that are on the phone, do they are there? Do you see their support systems, whether it's peers or family or whether do you get to see those develop as well? And you, do you get to gauge where they are in their journey when it comes to support systems, too? Yeah, a little bit. You know, I think, you know, for the most or most of the mentees right? the support system is the parents, um, the family and, and some teammates. You, you hear them talk about like for Atlanta United, right? Some teammates have gotten released recently and um, that's challenging not only for the players that got released, obviously, but for the teammates that are still there at Atlanta United who didn't get released and now their best friends, you know, leaving the team and they feel bad and and don't know who's going to be their best friend next year. And, you know, little things like that, Um, you know, so you can see that, you know, they've got these little support systems within their own team, but, um, you know, obviously a lot of the, mentees have good support systems at home um, from families. Um, I know that the staff, most staffs um, take that on as well, right? Coaches have an unbelievable opportunity to mold children, um, good or bad. And, um, you know, that's, it's kind of underestimated, I think, especially like at the, at the youth level, right. When we're talking about recreational coaches and, you know, not like top, top Atlanta United coaches, but like anybody, like a mom and a dad coaching, right. They, they still have an unbelievable um, amount of 
uh, sway over our children and how they feel and the confidence they give them or don't give them and, um, you know, the, the support that they give. So um, that that's that's super important to and, and I'm glad most of the kids have a good one, but uh, not all of them do. And that's where we, we try and fill in the gap sometimes as well. Yeah. Uh, Michael Parker is hanging out with us for the Friday free kick with uh, our friends at Beyond Goals Mentoring at MF Parkhurst and at BG Mentoring on the Twitters. Uh, Joe Bost is in this morning and he wanted to give you and Greg a shout out for tweeting pointers to kids beginning the tryout saga. Yeah, we uh, a, a few of our mentees had had said that they were trying out and we had started talking to them about what they're going through and what they're feeling. And so then we were like, well, surely there's thousands of other kids doing it. So we're like, well, why don't we kind of put this out there and just kind of throw out some little tips and we need to do more of that type of stuff. And um, we, we, we've thrown around the idea of like um, putting together like some course material type stuff for kids to kind of go through that don't want to go like the full mentoring route. Cause we understand not every kid, wants to jump on a call with me or Greg because they're intimidated or they're shy or whatever. Um, you know, obviously some families can't afford it. And so we're, we're in the early processes of trying to figure out, okay, how do we put together a course that has videos and things and it's interactive, right? So that we can give some of this information out there and available um, to, to more and more kids. But yeah, we need to do, um, you know, little things like that a little bit more often, which we're trying to get better at that. What were some of the pointers for those that uh, might need the information later? What were some of the, the pointers that were either most received or the light bulb went off for folks? What were some of those pointers that you shouted out? Um, the, the, the first one for me was, you know, you don't have to be perfect at tryout, right? Coach isn't looking for the perfect player that doesn't make a single mistake. Um, you know, so, so often we have this expectation that um, uh, we need to, we want to be perfect. We, we have to be, you know, super clean at everything and, and it's just unrealistic. And, um, you know, I say like the players that are, are making things happen and, and taking risks are more likely to make some mistakes and that's okay. The coaches want to see the ideas and the positioning and the effort and the reaction to those mistakes, um, more so than they want to see, Oh, can you connect every single pass and make every single play? Right. That's, that's crazy. Uh, they're not, they're not thinking that. Uh, so that was, that was a big one um, that we got good feedback on. Tryout anxiety is what burned is discussing mm -hmm. here. He's like uh, not a comfortable few weeks for kids yeah. and parents. He says he'd sign yeah. up for the course in a second. I mean, it's almost like parents need as much menteeing as the mentees do. We've absolutely thought about that as well. And trying to help with that as well, because you know, it's funny, I, I was literally just talking yesterday and thinking about um, this growth mindset and what goes into that and seeing losses and setbacks as a positive thing, right, of how to learn and how to get better rather than like, oh, we lost. And it brings me back to that Giannis clip. I love this Giannis clip, the the basketball player, when the play, the interviewer asks him was this season a failure and his answer to that was just amazing amazing answer um so anyone that hasn't seen that definitely youtube it but he, he gave such a great answer that there is no failure in sports there's just setbacks and you have to learn and it's a step-by-step -step process and he was like the, you know every year michael jordan didn't win the championship was that a failure like no he's he's getting He's getting there towards it. And I always think of that with parents, right, where they're screaming on the sidelines and going ballistic and stuff. And it's like, why? Right. Because you want your child to win so bad on that day. Um, and it's like, you know, we need to teach the parents growth mindset, right, of like, hey, win or lose, your kid can still learn something from the day and get better. Right. You know, we need to stop focusing on the short sightedness of like win today versus okay, we can still get better for the long run and have more success in the long run, even if we lose. Um, and and that, that can be taught down to the child as well. Um, but I think that would help a little bit with the, the comedy that is the sideline of uh, youth sports. And at the same time, you also, in addition to that comedy, have the, the, the living vicariously through the frustrated adult athlete that wasn't able to accomplish whatever they thought they were going to accomplish. And now all of that pressure 
that uh, that they have is now forced upon their children. And it, it's disappointing to see that because you want the child, you want that young athlete, that young person to develop their own thoughts and ideas and approach. Yet there's too many times where you see a parent who is pressing down on those ideas because of what they want for their child, for them, instead of what the child should be able to do for themselves. Right. Totally. Um, and, and I think that children feel that anxiety sometimes of like mom and dad being super nervous and wanting me to, to win, to make this team. And then that adds to the pressure for the child of like, Oh, now not only do I not want to disappoint myself, I don't want to disappoint mom and dad that I didn't make it. Um, but I get it from the parent perspective because my daughter had softball tryouts. Right. And I wanted her to make the team of course, because I thought she'd, you know, have a great experience and learn to love, softball a little bit even more um and she didn't make it she tried out for three different teams didn't make any of them um and and i felt bad for her but she had a great mentality about it and you know i you know tried not to put any pressure on her at all and you know i barely made myself visible during tryouts right like really far away just kind of watching um you know being as supportive as i can but i get that that the anxiety is real because we, obviously we want the best for our kids um so it's really a balance of, you know, supporting them, um, but also helping them understand like, okay, this is a good opportunity, right? Of, you know, you should take, try and take advantage of this opportunity um, that you have in front of you. So yeah, we're definitely trying to put some things together to help out. How long did it take you as a parent to, to sit there and go, okay, I need to go hide under a tree or I need to go hide behind these parents when it came to what you want for your kids and for them to succeed. Uh, I've always been like that. I can't stand. And probably a lot of parents think I'm an asshole, a jerk. There goes the explicit rating for today. All right. (laughs) Because I I rarely sit with the group. Um, And that's because I don't want to hear anything. Uh, I don't want to be a part of it. Um, And so I I usually go sit by myself or or further away. And it just is what it is. Um, Because... I still remember to this day, parents of teammates of mine when we were seven, eight, nine, ten years old, and they are screaming on the sideline. And, you know, I was always thankful that my parents weren't doing that. And, you know, I know that those players didn't appreciate their parents doing that. Um, so, you know, I never, ever would would be that parent. Um, I I don't look down upon those other parents that do because i get they're just trying to help out um their child but uh, it's not for me and, uh, and I, I stay far away all right last question for you and thanks for hanging out with us as you always do uh burned is asking as a center back and go, going back to the luisa ruju discussion mm. how would you defend a player that is so extremely one-footed like uh luis maybe like miggy somebody like that is it significantly easier or can guys still be a threat because of their quickness to get off shots etc how would you defend someone who is ex- so extremely one-footed yeah well i think that um it's okay that they're extremely one-footed because um like take take brooks for example right brooks is uh when he get wants to get a cross in it's always his right foot he's not cutting and and, and moving it to his left but his first step is so quick that he can get it off, right? It's similar to the guy, Antonio. I think they played for Manchester United. Um, he, he was a right wing back, maybe a right. Everybody knew he was going right. Uh, always, always, always. But he could still get his cross off every time. Miggy could go to his right, but he was just so fast that he could then cut in front of you and get on his left. Um, I don't know if Arujo is that fast, um, but for me, I just wouldn't let, I wouldn't give him space. Uh, Arujo is a, is a player that needs to like that open space to get going. And like, it doesn't seem like he's as um, sound when it's, it's really tight spaces. He's like that guy in transition who can push it by you, you know, do a few things. Um, so for me, I, I wouldn't let him have that space to try and get in transition. Um, in my older days, I would just kick him 
probably. <laughs> <laughs> I just had this vision of you kicking people now. Uh, what's the latest with Beyond Goals? Now that uh, high school season's over, everybody might be transitioning to camps and teams for the summer and college. What's the latest? Yeah, we are very close to finally announcing a partnership with Atlanta United. So there you go. Helping. We've got a, a sponsor now to, to help out with that. So um, trying to get those kids ready for uh, they've got playoffs coming up for um, MLS next. So a, a different type of anxiety and pressure that they're they're feeling going in towards that. Um, and uh, and like I said, trying to figure out this course stuff um, for, for players and different topics and how we can put it all together and where to host it. And gosh, I need to, I need to get better with technology, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't look at me, brother, because I'm right there with you. Uh, as always, great to catch up with you on everything going on with Beyond Goals and with mentoring. And, you know, if you if you ever want to break news about anything going on with Beyond Goals, you know, you can always break news here on the show. You know, you don't have, you don't have to wait. You know, we come here and break news. You break news here. Yeah. You let me know when you want Kano on as well, by the way. Anytime. Okay. Anytime we can turn this into a three way dance, we can turn it into a party line, does not matter. That's what 9 30 on Fridays is all about. Anytime you want anybody else to crash the party, forward the invite, we'll have fun, we'll do it, brother. Sounds good. All enjoy, right, en enjoy your scr non scramble format golf. I can't believe you didn't play scramble for that second 18. But what a mistake! You and me both, brother. We'll catch up in a couple weeks. Have a good weekend, everybody. All right, Michael Parkhurst. Michael Parkhurst, man. 99 on a second 18, understanding you probably should have been a scramble format. So, no, it's always great to have our friends with the Beyond Goals hanging out with us and breaking out a bunch of different topics. And and uh, thanks to Greg and, and Michael for putting up with my questions on a weekly basis because there'll be something that uh, literally, when it comes to uh, questions with the guys, for those of you watching on Twitch, that's how many questions I always have prepared. I have an idea as to where I want to go. Uh, and then just the conversation goes where it goes. 